Osiris. Welcome back to the Corner of Gray Street podcast and to another version of Combos on the Corner. This is a special one. And as always, I bring in my special friend, Nolan. What's going on, man? How are you feeling? Feeling great. I am. This is about the most excited I've been for one of our episodes. So I'm, I'm ready to get into it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Nolan over there has been has been struggling. He's this is his flu game right now. This is his Michael Jordan flu game. He's battling. Yes. He's going he's going hard in the paint. Um, but we've got it. It's for good reason. We Thank have you. a very special guest. Mr. Steve Lillywhite. Welcome to the Corner of Gray Street podcast, sir. Oh, thank you for having me, guys. Thank you. It's a, it's an honor. And, um, you know, sitting here in my in my 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 small place in bali and i'm thinking do people even remember me and it's very nice to uh to be asked oh well people remember uh they'll never ever forget in several different bands circles and we're actually going to get into a lot of that today but we again just are very excited to have steve on appreciate every second of his time today um, and appreciate everyone obviously that reached out um, and had some questions. We hope to go through some of those. And we hope to make this as different of an interview as possible um, from many other ones, especially DMB focused that Steve has done in the past. So we hope we do that for you guys. Um, and, you know, really, before we take a look back, Steve, let's talk about the present. You just talked about you're in Bali now, but what are you doing these days? What's going on? Um, we saw you were involved with U2's Atomic City. I was. Right. Uh, so what's going on? It, it, it started out actually that I got a call from Edge saying we're, we're, we're playing these gigs at a place called The Sphere and um, we're, we really have no idea what this new sound system is going to be like. We think it's, you know, it is a gig, but, but we're being told that this speaker system is, is so unique and it's so, you know, revolutionary that, that, that that, that we want someone who's been involved in our studio recordings to be part of the team putting together these shows because he felt that um, that sonically I might have something to offer because it's not like a normal gig. So, you know, I, I it was, you know, it was amazing, actually. I we, we did about six weeks rehearsal in the south of France, which is very U2. And then, um, and then we camped out at the Sphere for about two months before the first gig, nearly two months. And, and it was quite amazing because the Sphere wasn't completely kitted out. So we were very lucky to be able to, so they couldn't have it open anyway. So, so we had a longer rehearsal time than anyone else will ever be able to have in the space. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's, probably the most incredible show I've ever seen. And, and, and weirdly, it's, you know, that some people have said, oh, it's, you know, surely the band are completely crushed by the, by the, by the technology, you know, but in fact, it's, it's, it, it works. It works really well. And anyone who goes and says they're not impressed, I don't believe them because it is one of the most, it's like one of the wonders of the world at the moment. You know, if you take all the wonders of the world currently happening in the world, you two at the sphere is is absolutely one of those great things. And um, and you know, it's, it's they haven't announced other than Fish, who are only going to do four nights. I think they haven't announced anyone else yet. And I have no idea how Fish will go down there. Um, <laughs> knowing knowing both bands, it's it's going to be. Uh, It'll be very different, and um, yeah. But I, I, I it, it's it's wonderful, and I'm going to try and get back before you two finish because I want to go and see it just before the end as well. But yeah, I, I, so I did the rehearsals with them, and and they they employed me for the first five nights, and then once five nights are done, you know, everything sort of locks in. Um, so yeah, it was it, and it was a success, you know. They they really have um, you know I've 
I've known that band longer than anyone else. You know, I, I, my involvement is like nine albums. Oh, and during the, and during the setup of the Sphere shows, Bono wanted that they'd been recording this song, Atomic City, for a long time. And they, it sounded good, but it didn't sound great like the band. And he said, Steve, can you help us out? So we went into a studio uh, on a weekend and, and we got Larry, the drummer, because the, the, the U2's drummer is not well enough to play a series of gigs. He's well enough to do one gig and maybe two or three, but you never know when his back is going to go out. And then it's like six months of nothing. So they, he couldn't take the risk of trying it, but he was good enough to record on the single. So, so we went in and recorded the single and, um, yeah, and it turned out pretty good. And, and I was going, God, I, you know, I've been doing this for so long. You know, did I expect to be doing it again? I was, so it was, it was good fun. So that's what I've been doing in, in Indonesia. I, I, um, I work for, for KFC, which is very weird. I, um, Basically, at, at KFC in Indonesia, which is a destination restaurant, weirdly, because they don't have pork because it's mainly Muslim and they don't have beef because it's a bit, you know, it's still a, it's very expensive. So chicken rules in Indonesia and KFC has they've tweaked the the. You know, they serve it with rice because Indonesians love rice. They make a spicy one. And you ask any Indonesian and they uh, about their favorite fried chicken and it's KFC. They love it completely. And, um, and but my predecessor started bundling CDs with chicken. Right. And um, like the superstar combo. And when I took over the company that, 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 that curates the CDs for KFC, basically you have 10 CDs in the store and um, you can either buy it a la carte or you can have it part of a bundle. And it's mainly bundle. And, and it's become this sort of tradition where, where families go to KFC for their treat, for their meal. They get a CD as well. And, and it's all Indonesian music. And, you know, I have, to, I have to cater for the whole family. So I sort of see it a bit like, you know, each CD has to have a reason. You know, it's, it's not so much my taste. Because, you know, I do stuff for the kids. I do stuff for teenage girls. I do stuff for, for adolescent boys and, and for mum and dad. And I do an oldies compilation. I do all. But the great thing is I've learnt about the music and the culture here. And it's, and it's kept me young, really. It's kept my brain active. Because when I was living in America, I, I saw how music was going. And... And I, you know, I, I've said this in an interview before, but I didn't join the music business to be a typist. You know, I'm a people person. And I, and, and so many records now is just a solo person sitting at a computer, typing away their, their music. And that's not how I work. I love working with great musicians, you know, I mean, and, 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 and both DMB and, and, you know, and the best musicians are Americans, you know, and I, I've always said that. Now, the most creative, very often the Brits or the, or the Irish or the, the Celts, but, but actual technical ability, you cannot fault Carter Beauford. You can't fault Trey Anastasio. You know, these people are, you know, and I was listening to Fish the other, yesterday and, and like, I think Mike Gordon might be one of my favorite ever fucking bass players because he's just, he's so out there. You don't expect what you hear and you can if you just hone in on the bass it's a trip in itself it really i mean as well as fonzie of course who is you know god he was 17 when we did under the table and dreaming and one of the most confident self-assured people i've ever met i mean he was playing with a 40 year old carter beauford you know and um it was it was incredible but i digress um so yes so that's what i've been doing and um but but really i'm i'm at the tail end of my of my life my career so you know i'll i'll do sort of i'm not sure if i really want to go into the studio and set up a microphone and decide what you know what an album should be but 
but I, I still have something to give. So I, I like giving my occasional lectures. I, I, I like public speaking. I, I started my own show, actually. I did a one-man show, um, which had bits of music in and everything like that. And I did one, one gig in, in Jakarta uh, here, which was great. And then COVID came and, uh, and that put the kibosh on that. But it's, you know, proof of concept is good and I'm going to bring it out and maybe, and maybe bring it to a theater near you because um, I, I, I do enjoy public speaking and it's, you know, it's got lots of dad dancing and lots of silly stories about me being in the studio with my various artists. So, you know, if you, if you will never get to, that close to Dave Matthews or Bono, come and see me because, you know, it's one step removed. It's pretty good. Not bad. <laughs> not bad. Uh, well, yeah, let's, let's start getting into that since you are the, the guy who's one step removed from all these incredible bands that, yeah. I mean, everyone loves you two Rolling Stones, Fish, Peter Gabriel, Talking Heads, Matchbox 20, Guster, DMB. Um, can I just say Guster? I love that band. So I don't know if you're familiar with them at all. I just, the album I did with them was absolutely brilliant. Lost and Gone Forever. I, I, I listened to that. Mike, my, my, and it's both my eldest sons. They were 14 when, when it came out. And they just know every single part of that album as well. And they're actually, wow. they're going to play it at Red Rocks in August. And I said to my kids, do you want to come? I'll fly you to Red Rocks and we'll go and see Gusta play the album in sequence. And they said, oh my God, dad, you know, so I'm going to have a far, I mean, they're 38 years old, you know, so it's not like kids, <laughs> but, um, but you know, the three of us are going to, going to go and have a real bonding session listening to Gusta. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Well, no, I'm terribly sorry. No, that's, that's, we'll have to tell Norlander. Yeah, that's one of his favorite bands, and they oh, right, they yeah. like brought him on stage. At He's one of guested their shows. with them on stage. Yeah, he guested. well, me and Norlander have similar thing because I guested with them because I'm I'm a part time bass player, and because Gustin okay. never had a bass player in those days, I went actually on the road and did half a dozen gigs with them around um, North Carolina, actually I think. Oh wow! And, and it was great. I loved it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we're only we're like. 10 minutes into this and already uncovering incredible nuggets <laughs> here. Um, Thank you. So, okay. Uh, obviously we all know you from working with Dave and DMB. Um, DMB also huge fans of the artists you've worked with. Uh, can you kind of touch on some of the differences in like artistic approach and how the studio experience was between like Dave and DMB, you two and Bono, Trey and Fish. Oh, um, well, all bands, and it, you know, and and you actually, w without without saying it, you you've really caught on what 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 my strength is. My strength is bands. You know, mm -hmm. I love bands. I I I like solo artists, but they're much more difficult. If give me mm. a a band with an identity and a sort of sound and 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 something that i can i can listen to close my eyes and visualize how to translate that best onto record you know without taking away what is great about that band but also adding things on a record that help it last a long you know multiple listens um because I, I like to try and you know put things on records that you don't hear first time, you know, and after a while, you know, it's like, like the, the lie in our graves where I, I put, I, you know, I just recorded everyone playing table tennis and I, and I mm. put that in and it just felt so wonderful and beautiful. You don't really notice it to start with, but you know, just lots of little nice little Easter eggs in there, you know? Um, but th th there, there are differences between all those artists. But the one great thing about great bands and, and, and how I like to work with them is that I, I tend to think that you're only as good as your weakest link. So, I mean, there are producers who, you know, and, and, and you know, someone like Rick Rubin, who really doesn't care about certain members of the band. He and 
great for him. You know, he goes towards the brains. He 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 would work with Dave Matthews Band and he goes straight up to Dave and sit with Dave and work out, you know, and get Dave and understand him and and bring out the best of Dave. I I'm, you know, for better or for worse, I'm not like that. You know, I'll sit around with the band and I'll look and I'll see who who is a little bit worried about their place and and you know I, I i can i'm very empathetic when i'm talking to musicians you know and i can sense a lot of undercurrents of how a band interact with each other you know and i and and to this day i am absolutely proud of the fact that i'm the only producer in the world who has ever got a tune out of boyd tinsley in the studio <laughs> honestly <laughs> i mean um no one has understood the, the 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 very complicated brain of Boy Tinsley, but I have to say I did, and because one thing I I I realised, you know, is that yeah, so 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 I, I work on the weakest part of the of the team and try and bring them up and try and make them um, very, you know, try because you are only as strong as your weakest link. And I, and I, you know, as I say, some some producers don't think like me, but that's that's how I think um, within a band. And say with you two, it was the, you know, the bass player, who's a, who's a great guy and a great, great artist, but not a technical musician. So you can't treat him like a musician, you know. Um, so there's definitely uh, different ways of dealing with different people. But my first thought is make that weakest link as strong as possible. Then we can move forwards and, um, and make something that, that, that we all love, you know. Pretty cool. Yeah, I can't, that's... Remember, the, I can't remember the question, but I... I no, it was... <laughs> no, no, that's, we that's just... basically that was my good. philosophy. Uh, now, <laughs> with fish... You say to me, who is the weak link in fish? Oh, it's going to be my question. Absolutely. I, I mean, it is, you know, I, I did, I, I described fish once and I think Trey really loved my description because he's used it since. And, and I, I say the great thing about fish as a jam band, they're like a flock of birds flying in the sky, you know, and they all move and they all move in, in sequence. They don't, you, they're not all on little walkie talkies saying, okay, in 10 seconds, we move to the right. You know, they don't, they do it naturally. And that's how fish jam their music. They don't say, let's do this now. They just, it's an instinctive thing between the four of them, how they, how they, 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 they move like a flock of birds. You know, they don't ever say, let's do this. It just happens. And it's brilliant. Now, I've always thought that, you know, Dave, I don't see Dave Matthews as so much of a jam band. I mean, they do jam a little bit, but it's 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 soloing, you know. Um, they don't necessarily, they do sometimes go off on, I mean, I haven't seen them in years, but, you know, they do sometimes go off on tangents and stuff like that. But, but really, it's, um, you know, fish really truly are, you know, the, 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 the a great jam band and probably the greatest covers band in the world. Now, I'm I'm saying that, and that's not completely a nice thing to say, because sometimes when you can play anything, it is a um, it may not be as good as having limitations, because limitations in art make your different possibilities n narrows down what you can do. And that can sometimes be a great thing. The thing about Fish is that they can play anything because they are such incredible musicians. But what I like a little bit more, say, with, with you know, say the U2's bass player, really his strength is going boom, 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 boom. So, you know, you have to make a great song with that sort of bass player. With Dave Matthews' band, in those early days, you had a violin player who, you know, boy, if he had frets, it would have helped, you know. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you had a, and you had a jazz club sax player 
who really, you know, was was I, I knew nothing about the world of Dave Matthews Band, you know, and and so I I there was definitely limitations within that, and and you know, but because of that, you had something amazing, and you know. You, you you listen now to to to, to some of the records of um, of say Dave and and I and I just hear a normal brass section. I hear something that is very good, but you know and very well played and it's great. But but back in these early days, we had to really fight with Roy together. You know we were a we were a we were we were in the trenches together looking. For those little nuggets of something special you know um now with the backbone of this incredible drumming and this incredible bass playing and tim reynolds and all that stuff it was great but 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 with boy boyd and leroy it was a whole you know producing boyd and leroy was completely different to producing carter and stefan because they were completely different characters so i had to work specifically with each of them you know and uh and and, and you understand i think you understand. yeah you know yeah, absolutely that, that for me is what my strength as a producer is you know with people now of course if you make records just on a computer i'm fucking useless i can't be bothered <laughs> <You know? laughs> well it all sounds the same when you do it that way um Which but is that's weird. you say it all sounds yeah. the same and you're right it does but you have yeah. so many more possibilities yeah. But everyone def defaults to the same thing. <coughs> and that's the weird thing. Maybe we should force you to make a make an album on the computer and just see what you come up with. Um, <laughs> but no, that was that was a really good point about the, the horn section. We're actually going to dive into that question. That's going to be a prelude to a question down the road when we dive into Away From The World and some of those differences. Mm -hmm. But before we get into how you got started with DMB, and we'll we'll just do that quickly. How did you actually get your start in music, Steve? I don't think we've ever heard you talk about where you actually got your complete start. 1972, I, um, I managed to get a job in a recording studio. I was 17 years old. I was really shouldn't have got the job because I lied about the, um, about the, 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 uh, the, the, things you needed to get the job because it was in 72 you know it was very much white coats and you had to have certain qualifications from school well i knew in my heart that i didn't pass the qualifications but the results hadn't come through yet so when they asked me do you have you got this qualifications i went well i'm sure i'd have passed but you know the, the result hasn't come. now the fact is in the exam i walked out after 15 minutes and just signed my name I did not answer one question. <laughs> so the chances of me passing was zero. So it was a lie. I mean, I will say, but I said, well, I'm not sure if I, you know, I, I probably passed, I said. Anyway, so they gave me a three month um, trial period. And of course, you know, three months later, I was running around making everyone cup the tea, being jolly, chappy, Steve Lillywhite, you know, and, um, and no one ever questioned about, you know, they never said to me, what happened about your qualifications, which I got a triple F or something, whatever the lowest one you can get. So I was in, I was in into a recording studio and, um, and I just, you know, I've had lucky break after lucky break, really, I, I have to say. And, um, and I managed to get a hit record in um, 1978. And it was at the beginning of punk rock in, in the UK. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a catch 22 thing. The, the, in those days, you know, you, you would only get a hit if you got the work, but how would you get a, I mean, you would only get the work if you had a hit. So it was like, it was, in, you, you needed the hit to get the work, but you needed to work to get the hit. And all of a sudden there was this punk rock and it was sort of like a, a wave that I, that I surfed and I managed to get a hit. And at that point, it was absolute. It, it made me think, like, there's two ways you can think. You can think, wow, I've had a hit, aren't I good? But for me, it was never like that. It was, I've had a hit, 
oh my God, I can choose to work with really cool people. Right. And that's how I really, um, you know, I never thought I was any good. But if I delivered a hit <coughs> to someone, then maybe someone else would trust me. And if I, you know, and because I've had the hit, I could choose someone good. You know, I use my, you know, um, very opinionated in those days about what I felt was good and bad. You know, so so I, I was very lucky. And in, in, in fact, it was probably my second or third hit was a band called XTC, um, who were fantastic. Three letters, XTC. And Dave happened to be, Dave Matthews happened to be a big fan of XTC. So I was on his list of producers. Now, by the time that list got to me in London, they had already decided to work with um, a guy called Jerry Harrison from Talking Heads because Jerry had produced uh, the Spin Doctors, I think. Was it Spin? I can't remember if it was Spin Doctors. I, he'd, he'd, done, he'd done a couple of things in that world. Yeah, he'd done Live, the band Live, that's right. And he'd had a couple of hits. And he was, you know, me and him were, 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 were sort of even on the, on the producer scale, you know. And but they, they pretty much agreed to work with him. But I heard uh, remember two things. And I remember this as as clearly as I remember my anything in my life. I remember being in my living room and putting on remember two things. And it started with the snare drum, you know, uh, on um, ants marching. And this snare drum keeps going. And I'm going. And as it kept going, I remember thinking, okay, the longer this goes on, the more the stakes rise as to how good it must be, because you're pissing me off. So, you know, so I keep hearing this snare drum and, and, and I go through this whole thing in my mind, like, you have to impress me. It's getting now 20 seconds. You need to really impress me. And of course, me being a fucking skinny, well, not skinny white boy, but 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 a man who claps on one and three. I was hearing the snare drum as if it was like on the one and on the three. And of course, then, da, 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 da. and I went, fuck's sake, that is brilliant. And I absolutely, right at that moment, fell in love with Dave Matthews' band. And I phoned up my 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 guy in London. I said, I need to... I need to go and see this band, who I need to speak. So I spoke to the A&R guys, uh, Pete Robinson and, uh, and Bruce Floor in New York. And I said, look, I need to come and see this band. They said, well, to be honest, we're pretty much decided on Jerry Harrison, but they are playing Irving Plaza next Wednesday. So I went, Irving Plaza in New York, I'm there. So I jumped on a plane, flew to New York, went to see the gig. Jerry Harrison was there. I mean, I'd produced Jerry Harrison, you know, I mean, uh, I produced a Talking Heads album. So I, I knew him well. And we were chatting and I said, Jerry, I want this band. You know that? He says, well, you know, we're mates, you know, we'll, who, who, it's not up to me and him. It was up to the band. And I press ganged Dave and the band so much. Uh, and I said that, that, that I, I got the gig. And uh, and I'm so glad I did because I I I was the right guy for them. I, I really feel it, and um, and yeah. you know because I I cemented the idea of 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 what a great band is with them. I don't think they quite you know I I made them feel like a great band because as I say that that. That, that cementing together the, the weakest link and, and, and treating them all um, together. And, and also, you know, Dave said there was this guitarist they wanted to use. We're going to bring him in for overdubs. And for some reason, I said, no, 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 no. Have him there at the beginning. I just felt that really the, the music was just one acoustic bass and drums. You know, and there's there was really no real. I felt like on 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 the on the rhythm track we needed to to bolster that, 
and and I didn't just want to double track Dave's acoustic left and right. That felt boring, you know. But to have two acoustic players playing left and right, now that means that because they're different players, it didn't matter if they weren't completely synced up together because they would be playing slightly different things and slightly different feels. So with two players, see, when you've got just one player double tracking what he's doing, if it doesn't sound exactly the same in each speaker, it sounds not tight. But two players can be not tight and work, you know. So I'm so glad I got Tim to come to the studio right from the very beginning. And and I never let Tim play any electric guitar on Under the Table and Dreaming. That was my, you know, that was my thing. Um, and in fact, on Crash, I wanted to keep the idea of no electric guitar, but we did actually electrify the acoustics. We put the acoustics through. So that was the, one of the differences between Under the Table and Dreaming and Crash was, was making the acoustics through electric. And it was only on Before These Crowded Streets that, that I ever let Tim pick up an electric guitar in the studio. And <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Those, those were all great calls. Um, yeah. I know you've, you've talked a lot about Under the Table and Dreaming, so I just want to kind of get your general like takeaways, like looking back on it now, what, you know, what do you think of when you think about that album and it being really DMB's like first big moment um, that kind of set a great path for them? Yeah, I remember, I, I just remember being up at Bearsville in Woodstock in September and it just being, it was just such a beautiful American dream sort of a experience for me you know it was it was uh it was I'd never been I'd been to New York and maybe been to LA once before I did that but to be in sort of rural America and you know and and Woodstock was just so fantastic it had the the it had two great it had a it had a club called the Joyous Lake you know how hippie is that and uh, and Tinker Street Cafe. And these are places that had gigs every night. And it was great. And bands played, you know, when bands were recording at Bearsville, they would go and do a gig at Tinker Street Cafe. Fish did, Dave Matthews Band did. You know, it was part of the your, your rite of passage when you were working at Bearsville. You would go and do a gig at the local place. It was great. Uh, and, and, you know, we met and there was love, lovely girls there and and the sun was always shining and we would drink wheatgrass and 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 it was just a joyful joyful time you know and um but weirdly it was in 94 when we did that it was when my you know i basically i finished the album went back to london and um and my first marriage fell apart you know I decided that I didn't want well I decided that I I was uh yeah nah, there was no point in just talking there was there was no one else but I just she she thought my lifestyle was not great and uh, and I decided not and I wasn't doing anything to to calm myself down with my with my lifestyle so so we 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 split up. So I was feeling pretty down in London. So when and th and then I got the call saying, "Oh, Steve, we're we're remixing the album," you know. Uh, and I was come from I come from the era when you know someone remixes your album, it's you don't think it's very good. They don't think it's very good. So they've got you know they they don't think you've done a good enough job. So. Um, so they remixed the album and and I said, well, do what you like. You know, I've got my own problems here, you know. And then like a, two, three months later, I'm I start getting like, oh, you know, that album you did. I said, Dave Matthews band, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. He says, you know, it's doing pretty good. It's like number 30 in the charts. I went, really? Oh, my God. Then the next week, you know, it's number 25 in the charts, don't you? And it's like. And it kept going up and every week it kept selling more and more. And I'm, you know, but I'm, I'm miles away from this. I'm not 
I'm not in the record company offices getting high fives, you know. And also RCA, <laughs> remember, in those days, RCA was called the Record Cemetery of America. Uh, they never had hit records. They survived on Elvis Presley, back catalog. Yeah. You know? So suddenly RCA was a hit label <coughs> with, um, with, with Dave Matthews Band. And still I was going, well, you know, they got someone else to remix it good on them you know i'll probably make some money i don't know i don't not really thinking about that so then when i got the call oh steve they want you to do the second album i went really but you got someone to they said no 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 the band love you you know they love working with you and they want you to produce the album we'll talk about the mixing later so you know because I, I still mean obviously i think my mixes are always better than the mixes of someone else because the way i record i don't i record and mix as i go along you know so i i believe that what i end up with for my productions are the best mixes because the things are completely interlocked i don't just record for someone else to mix i i record and mix at the same time um so i always think my mixes are you know although because I record that way, you can't fuck up the mixes too badly. But still, I'm in my head, I love what I end up with, you know. Um, so when it came to Crash and we recorded it, to be honest, the label didn't, the label said, didn't say we want Tom Lord Algae to, to mix it. They, uh, and it was me who said, look, I'm feeling better about this. I like this album. Tom is in New York. I'm in New York. Let me go in with him and we'll do some mixes with him. So he mixed some of the songs and I mixed some of the songs on my own. And, uh, and you know, not one person has ever said, oh, the mix of that is better than the, you know, I mean, hey, who knows? But I'm, <laughs> uh, but I, I uh, yeah. But then the, the, the only album with Dave Matthews that, was my vision completely from beginning to end was before these crowded streets because on that one i recorded it completely and mixed it completely myself so um that was that was the closest to my vision of all the albums i've worked with them because you know it was the purest of 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 just me and the band's vision you know because there was no one else there was no one else involved, you know, even away from the world, uh, <coughs> which will, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. That was, really yeah, I think you're, I think you're alluding yeah. to another question that we've got about that. You are spot on, uh, my friend, but yeah, um, on the, on the crash side, obviously, you know, that's the most commercially successful album they've ever yeah. done. Um, it's the one that if you ask someone, if they know they've met, Oh yeah, crash. Right. Um, but there are some, you know, obviously, Commercial success and studio masterpieces don't always line up. Um, you know, before these crowded streets, not the most commercially successful, but Two Step, the the Forty One, and Say Goodbye there in the middle, and Proudest oh. Monkey are those. And Nolan and I were talking about those are just all three of well, four of those songs are incredible studio masterpieces that are you know in the top 10, 15 that you ever did song wise with them. What do you remember about those and what, like, is there anything that stands out to you just about those songs in particular? Oh my God. Uh, same again. Say goodbye. Line. So uh, really, I mean, if two step yeah. and proudest monkey are probably two of my favorites, honestly, just studio oh, yeah. performances on that album. Yeah. The, the two step was, was great because I, I remember, uh, da -da 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 -da, there was the great, I think Carter did it one time this drum thing and I just freaked out. I said, Carter, that is great. You know, cause he's so brilliant. He's such a brilliant drummer. He does all these things and it's like, and he's very teachable as well, you know? So I brought him in. I said, listen to that. Just that you just did it one time. If you copied, you can make that into a part. And it just became this amazing thing on two step. And um, so, so that was great. And I, Proudest Monkey was, was very simple. You know, it was, um, there was not, you know, on some of the other songs I would do crossfades and I would, 
and I would take out, I would structure it like I would take out the band, it, especially on Crabby Streets, actually. I would, I would take all the instruments out and just leave certain things and, and, um, and use the mixing desk as a, as a real instrument, you know. And I, and I did on, there was a crossfade, right, with Say Goodbye, Mm -hmm. Does it say goodbye? Crossfade? Forty-one and say goodbye. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that was that was great. And doing crossfades in those days was not an easy thing because you had <laughs> cause it was all on tape. So um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So that, no, that I, look. They they again. That album was done in Woodstock, um, and it was. Uh, but but you know, I've said this in in many interviews. I I. I grew up with the Beatles first time round, and what I loved about them was the fact that each record they made, you knew it was the Beatles, but it was a progression sonically. There was something about the record that was different to the one before. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was still the same band, and you knew it was still the same band, but it was, and, and, and they, and I remember being taken on a journey by the Beatles because each time a new record came out, it was like, Oh my God, what have they done now? You know, and that's what I always, if I'm lucky enough to do more than one album with any artist, I always want to take them on this journey, you know, to take the, take the, the listener on a journey. So I, I'd, I'd like to think that you listen to, uh, to, to under the table and then to crash and then to um, Crowded Streets. And then, funnily enough, even on the fourth album, that was a completely different sound. I hadn't been, I wasn't allowed to finish my vision of that album, but it was, um, but it was all my vision, you know, and that was why I got fired, because, because no one got my vision. <laughs> you know um and and it was slow you know um but i warned them that it would be slow i said if you make a record in your hometown there's mm -hmm. a subtle difference in your mentality as creative people because if you're living in your hometown if you go away to record which we did we the first two we the band went to woodstock the third one we went to sausalito it was going away from your environment for a set amount of time. You were going away for a project and you were away from home. So you have this mentality of being away, right? And I warn them, you make a record in your hometown. All of a sudden, it's not making a record. You are going to work. Now, anyone who has a job has the option of not liking that job and of complaining about it. You know, that's what a job is. You know, it's not a vocation anymore. A vocation, you're not allowed to complain about it. A job, you're allowed to complain. And all of a sudden, people started to complain because it was taking too long. And there was, all of a sudden, they took their eye off this artistic, creative vision, and it was a job. You know, Dave Matthews Band has never been a job. It's fucking the greatest thing that you can be involved in don't think of it like a job so you know maybe i i didn't eloquently explain it well enough to the record company but you know it was running but still i didn't think that i would be treated like i was um you know and and and, and i've said this before and i will say it again the thing that most hurt was that when they re-recorded it as busted stuff, um, Glenn Ballard got a thank you on that album and I didn't even get a fucking thank you. Nothing, you know, and it was my album because that's why I got fired. Now, if they reinvented that album and changed it completely, then I can see why not, why give Steve a credit. It was just like, you know, a, not such a good version on some of the songs because it was not as lovingly put together. And, you know, my, everything on the Lily White sessions that you hear was all mixed in one morning. Um, mm. I mean, literally, I, I, I put all those together.
before we left at lunchtime. I came in early. I mixed them all myself, you know, didn't even have the engineer there for half of them. Um, you know, so, yeah, that's the thing that, that hurt me the most. That, that, and it wasn't, I'm sure no one in the band even thought, shouldn't we give Steve a credit on this? You know, because it was, you know, but to give Glenn Ballard a thank you on an <laughs> album that's my fucking record, fuck off. Anyway. Well, well we <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are very thankful for you. Oh, that definitely seems like a, a management move and... Oh Something yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Look, it's, look I'm, yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big boy. I mean, I, I, I get it, but, um, but you know, that's life. Say lovely, yeah. as we say. <laughs> I definitely, uh, I love the comparison with like the progression, like the Beatles and then DMB, because you can hear it in all of the albums that you worked on. And just so yeah. you know, like every DMB fan thinks of you as like the George Martin for DMB. Oh, like that's very, that's very gracious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, no, I mean, certainly with, the, with the classic lineup is um, it was, you know, it was just wonderful. And even twink tweaking that classic lineup a little bit, you know, for away, away from the world, mm -hmm. you, 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 you slightly tweak that thing and, 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 and the mystery of what a Boyd and Leroy give you suddenly, suddenly changes. And Boyd was then left out on his own as being the only eccentric, per, you know, with, 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 with Leroy. Leroy was a great musician, but he was just as eccentric in his own weird way as Boyd was as eccentric as a non-musician. You know, so the two of them really worked sort of great together as these these sort of wild creative but 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 needing to be managed sort of characters you know you bring in the session guys and then all of a sudden you know it's uh and it's not their fault i mean they they've only ever been session guys so they've you know they've not been in a band they don't understand the, the that sometimes you have to push yourself to that point of of something to get the greatest parts you know so anyway i don't want to say too much i don't want to be negative about about too much but you know it was the the, the balance on away from the world was not um was not as 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 finely tuned to make great creativity uh and it was a pity because um I, I i although i did listen to it yesterday for the first time and and i've got to say there's some really good things in there i you know broken. we'll get there don't don't get there yet don't spoil it steve okay <laughs> Keep going. i'm like he is he's going he's going and he is you're right on it too i mean that is yeah just save it just save yeah. it Okay. Nolan, I know you had um, one more question about before you use credit streaks. And then we'll move into the 2000s. We'll get out of the 90s. We'll get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, first off, just a personal thank you for your work on Two Step and Crush, my okay. two all time favorite songs. So, okay. right. good, good. amazing. Um, it's, so, it's so funny, though. Crush, I just, they, Dave didn't have a name for it. And I made a joke because of Crash. I said, oh, call it Crush. And he went, okay. And he, you know, he's great like that. So he did started out as a sort of working title, but he kept it. Yeah. It's perfect. I, I perfect. love that um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so good. Um what what was the difference like between before these crowded streets and the other two albums where you have like new material creating stuff from scratch? Mm -hmm. Um and they're not a ton of live songs or you know like a halloween is like a very it was very unpolished live like what what was yeah. the was that challenging it was more challenging um it meant more rehearsals in the studio what you have mm -hmm. to do at that point you have to sort of somehow fast track the songs to 25 gigs in you know mm -hmm. and uh, and and to try and get 
a drummer especially to play a song 25 times while everyone else works out their parts sometimes difficult so you you you, you have more rehearsal and more jamming in the studio but it, you can come up with great stuff because i was always there to sort of say listen to this that was great use that and you know so we would they would come in and listen we would discuss the 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 takes and then they would go out and play it again so the, the whole idea was to get it get them to a point where they sounded gigged in a little bit because at the end of the day you know they, they they're a great live band and and i wanted this you know but but also it gave us some great opportunities to um as i said the the idea for crowded streets was to use different musicians you know so we got the ladies in the chronos quartet alanis morissette um the the the, the, the chapman stick guy greg yeah. howard greg howard, greg howard. Great. oh my god um you know Bela. Bela, 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 yeah. yes yeah uh, so you know all these these other musicians and and i was saying bring it on you know let's for all the the, the 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 fact that Crash and Under the Table was just the unit of us in the studio, this we wanted to expand and um, and to get bigger. You know, so uh, piano, um, which we we had piano, we'd never had piano before. Um, so, so it was, you know, it it was much more of a Cecil B. DeMille production. You know, it was it was much more like a, a a big a big operation. You know, but um, but I I personally love that album. Um, I, I think probably Dreaming Tree is one of my favourites. Uh, mm. Just just it's got that, yeah, just wonderful. Yeah, that's and, incredible. It is. And Crush, yeah, yeah, I'm very happy. Yeah. And and from that comes one of the most iconic pictures of all time, which has your actual handwritten names of the songs, right, that are down on the sheet of paper. Um, and one of them, well, we'll get to, but the other one I wanted to talk about is Chim Chimney, which was The Stone. Did you come up with that? Because literally the riff sounds like Chim 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 Chimney. Chim, chim, chim. Is that what it was? I can't remember. It was, you know... <laughs> Dave, you have to name everything it's really it's much easier for each song to to have a name even if it's not the final name just when you're talking about them you know and it and and a name is better than saying number one number five mm. or in dave's mm. case number 30 number 41 you know um so you know, they, it, so we did put them names. And, and in those days, I would always write a sheet of paper for each song title and pin them up on the on the uh, on the wall behind. And in fact, Dave, who is a great artist, would do the titles of the songs on each piece of paper. So and then if there was. Anyone had any idea, oh. You know, at some point you, you're listening back and you don't want to say to Steve, you don't want to say to me, can we try a woodblock on this song? All you do is you go to the piece of paper and you write, try woodblock, question mark. So it's written there. So, in, you know, you're not interrupting the flow of the of the recording. You, you have the ability to go and write your idea down as you're in the flow. And, and, and to be able to visually look at the songs all on a piece of paper behind you. And, and it's funny, I, and all these sheets of paper have long since gone. And I saw a photo of me with you 2 on their first album. And behind them are all these sheets of paper that I put up. And I'm going, where the fuck are they? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I money, the handwritten oh. lyrics of With or Without You that I threw away. <laughs> you'd be you'd be sitting in a golden throne right now doing this podcast you know, um, but you're, you're either a person who keeps things or you're a person who just yeah. enjoys not having stuff and i am i don't like owning things you know uh, i i'm much yeah i mean i i think yes it might be nice to have them but but would i ever look at them no yeah. you know and then what do you do you 
sell them for money. You can only spend so much money. And it's a bit cheesy to sell stuff like that. It's, you know, is it mine? Yeah, it's sort of mine because it was my idea and my handwriting a lot of the time. But but Dave's handwriting, you know, he would like do these flowery. Um, yeah, he was very. <laughs> well, he's just a. Brilliant. He's a good doodler. Oh, he's he's the, <laughs> that's a great expression. Yeah, he's a great doodler. That's uh, amazing. He's a great dude as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> and and also obviously on that sheet of paper, one of the more famous not known songs in dmb lore the fans have clamored for it for years and years and that of course is the mac head um and we wanted to do something a little different um as we we have been privy to the song for several years now um and we wanted to get steve's reaction to it so we actually sent steve one of the takes of mac head that we that we have and send it to him and ask him a little bit, not only for his reaction and be like, oh yeah, this was it. Why did I, why was it called Mackhead, like McCartney Radiohead? And also how many other versions did y'all actually, how many takes were there? I, well, in terms of, I don't, I don't know how many takes there were. If you've got another one, that would be interesting. We don't. But, you, know, <laughs> you know, honestly, I, I doubt if there were very many because, um, because the song was never really taken to the next level you know it was just because it didn't it felt a little bit too well i mean just the title you know it does sound a bit like a paul mccartney song maybe uh, uh i wish it had had more radiohead than paul mccartney yes. Actually, listening back, it would have it would have suited um crowded streets album better if it was a bit more radiohead but but mm -hmm. we never got we never got to take it more Radiohead. So, it, you know, it's a beautiful song, like Paul McCartney's style song. And, um, <coughs> and uh, yeah, but, but, but yeah, we, we didn't take it any further. Uh, I'd forgotten that it did talk about the alleged worm that I think I saw, although... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone became quite obsessed with this story. Okay, so we eat Indian food one night. And I am convinced the next morning when I'm doing my thing, I look down just to check. What do I see as this little worm like wiggling around in my stuff? And I think, <laughs> oh, my God, fuck. What is that? Oh, that's uh. so I go into work and, 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 you know, uh, being a little ADHD, of course, I don't keep it to myself. And I, and I start, um, and I bring this up and like, and, and Leroy especially is like, Oh my God, no, I'm going to die. Oh, I feel terrible. I feel terrible. Um, <laughs> Dave thinks it's quite funny. And, and Dave is always using whatever's going on around him for his lyrical idea you know and sometimes you know so so it became quite uh in fact there's earlier versions of rapunzel that also mention my my worm <laughs> as well yeah, but, yeah the guide vocal of rapunzel mentions the worm I, and i do remember that so i've forgotten that the worm was also mentioned on Mackhead. um and and yeah i i Look, I went to the doctor. The doctor gave me some pills. <laughs> no one else saw anything. I never saw it again. I'm beginning to think. I, and that, I was sober at that point. That was my first sober album, actually. Um, so I, uh, so I, I, I wasn't making up. I mean, whether I was mistaken or not is another thing. But. But, but I, I, in my mind's eye now, I can, I can see exactly how it was wiggling. And, um, you know, but there you go. It never appeared again. No one else got a worm. And, and it just goes into folk history. <laughs> Listeners. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah exactly. but, but, but yeah, the song, which is much more interesting than the story about my worm. Um, <laughs> the, the song... The song, um, as I say, if we'd 
decided that that it had a place in the big picture of that album, we would have had to have made it more Radiohead, I think. Um, I think it would have worked. And maybe, you know, but, but you know, in those days, like, OK Computer had just come out and, and Radiohead were just fantastic. And Dave especially mm-hmm. loved them and I loved them. And um, so we would have had to have really made it a good Radiohead style song. Otherwise, we would have just been seen as, you know, copycats. And that's the great thing about, you know, Dave Matthews Band never copied anyone. You know, it wasn't, I mean, maybe a little Paul Simon here and there uh, with Dave, but, but you know, but as a band, Dave Matthews Band were in those days completely unique. It was, they were as unique as Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band were. You know, a bunch of, of ne'er-do-wells all put together to make something absolutely unique. It was fantastic. I loved it. And, you know, we've got all the stuff like Leroy's, you know, that was the early cell phone days and Leroy's cell phone going in the studio, mm-hmm. you know, and, and me putting all these weird sounds behind it to make it seem like it was like, you know, because I I loved all that on like David Bowie, early David Bowie albums, they, he would have leave this stuff in. And I always thought records were so clean and you have, you can't have that talking. You can't have that. Why not? It's like these lovely little clues and to get the listener <laughs> really, you know, to, because most of the time, if you put something in a song, if they hear it, it means they've listened to it so many times that they must love it. So by definition, They're not going to hate it when they hear something new. So why not do that? Give them something for the 25th listen. And they go, oh, my God, because you won't listen to it 25 times if you don't like it. So by definition, you like that song. So give them something to to notice that far down the line, you know. You you explain that a lot on Norlander's conversation with that. So for those who haven't listened to that, go find Matt Norlander's podcast <laughs> record and riffs where he goes into detail of all those things. Steve goes through all those things. We don't want to make him rehash those right now, but it, it reminded me, I like to think that if Mac had made the album and taught titled, whatever it would have been called, um, that the beginning of it would have been stay, would have stayed in there where they're counting in there. And um, I yeah. think Carter's laughing and it sounds like Leroy or someone else just goes, stop laughing. <laughs> and then I think Carter dies laughing and then they go into the song and I'm like, that should, that would have been one of Steve's things that he probably would have thrown in somewhere. Well, we did, we did it right. Even on the first album, doesn't Carter at the end of drive in, drive out say that's bad as shit. Yeah. That's bad that's as shit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All those, you know, anyway, it's also good. where are we? So we've, 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 <laughs> we've managed to, to survive y2k yeah we are all still here oh man yeah into your favorite album (laughs) oh well the the fourth one yeah Yeah. i've spoken about that yeah we'll we'll brief over it you know it's um i i loved it it was as i say the band i did warn the band that recording in your hometown makes you think of it as a job not as going away to make a record. So it will take longer. I warn them that, you know, I I have a great, you know, I've been making records for so long that I can foresee problems before they appear, you know, and I did foresee the problems and, and, um, and the studio wasn't, it was very low ceilings. It was in the middle of summer. It was not a great place to be you know it was and also you know like you know Leroy would have a dental appointment and then so and so and so there was a lot of, lot of sitting around for everyone to come and yeah. um and uh, and I suppose because Crowded Streets was not the commercial success of Crash the the record company heard this sort of album becoming going even a bit more into dave's dave's alcoholic not alcoholic but his um his melancholic thinking 
you know, and and going, hmm, more melancholy, less sales. You know, we better, you know, we need more jolly up. You know, we need more tripping billies. We need more yeah. aspirational songs, you know, and that's fine. You know, but do it on the next album. Allow the process. You know, you'd have, you, they trusted me on the process up until that point, you know, just to let me finish this fucking record. But, you know, it was, um, it was one of those things. It, 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 it did get leaked, not by me. Um, <laughs> and we don't. Has, has was it Stefan? I don't know. Or was it Leroy? One of the, I think I heard it was one of those two. I can't remember. Um, but there's always <coughs> a lot of rumors. Stories, yeah. and rumors. But I don't know if it was if it was if it was leaked specifically yeah. as a antidote for um, every day. I don't know, but it you know perhaps you know someone was playing it to a friend and they said, "Can I borrow your CD?" They ripped it, you know. In those days, it was difficult. You didn't. How do you do that? Where do you say? You know, it was like I didn't understand much about that sort of thing, and uh, and all of a sudden, there it is on Napster. There it is. My favorite was the Entertainment Weekly magazine that reviewed both albums next to each other, and <laughs> oh and gave the Lily White sessions the uh, the better review. Of course. Oh. But, why? Know. Well, I wonder why. <laughs> what? Uh, well, what did you think about it getting leaked? Do you remember, like, at the time, what were you like? I mean, well, were you glad thought, because you put? My first thought was, I hadn't, guys, I haven't finished this. It's not. Yeah. Um, mm. but, but in a strange, well, you know, give me another month or another six weeks with them on that. Seems like a long time, but you know, it's to get those final little lovely bits on a record, you know, I mean, some parts of it were, were great, you know, didn't have that much more to do, but other mm. things, you know, still were needed, um, needed some, some focusing, you know, and those things take time and uh, yeah, but Hey, but they, they, that's life. Yeah. yeah. Nothing more yeah. I can I can say about it really, but you know yeah. I, I still yeah I'm still proud. I well I'm proud that people think it's well I like the idea it's got my name on. Someone yeah. came up to That's me. That's the once. coolest thing about it. Yeah, exactly. So I, someone came up to me once, not long after it was, you know, and and they said, and and they I said my name was Steve Lillywhite, and they said, oh you got the same name as that Dave Matthews album. You know, <laughs> yes. yes, strange but, coincidence. Strange That's coincidence. so funny. Well, yeah. hey, yeah. we got to hear Studio JTR and uh, Monkey Man. So, oh, God. Yeah, 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 that was incredible. Um, I wish Monkey Man had shown up live at some point, but I will say, we have always heard the line, Where's the tripping billies on this? and it's always driven me nuts because to me, like sweet up and down it is an easy, like would be, I think it'd be a, like a great hit single. Like that right, to me yeah. is the tripping billies. And I, I don't know. That's just crazy yeah. to me. Yeah. 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 I know that's, <laughs> life. that's life. Anyway. Okay. We, well, we it's ah. good. as long as we have yeah. our help, it's all good. Yes. It is always all good. Exactly. As long as we're upright. Um, but yeah, after that, Steve, you know, there was there's this massive kind of period um, of, well, as you said it, you you know, you get fired and whatnot and non ceremoniously. Uh, the, the band moves on to doing some other things. Dave does some devil with uh, with Steve Harris, right. um, which which is, you know, a very um, well regarded album. Yeah. Um, and you know, Steve was, Steve did a lot of stuff with you previously on the other albums. Um, and then he, you know, did busted stuff, um, as, as the producer, you know, what kind of were y'all's relationships throughout kind of those, 
seemingly from a distance awkward times when you were teammates and then you know what was I, that like Steve's a lovely guy I mean look um you uh I think maybe because I I stopped drinking on crowded streets and and Dave was drinking quite a lot on the Lily White sessions. He needed someone to go out with and be his his buddy. And I wasn't really that person anymore. I was more like his uncle on the earlier albums, you know, in terms of his partying buddy. But, you know, I would like to think I was like the cool uncle, the cool English uncle that you've got, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um uh but 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 Harris became closer to him during Lily White sessions, you know, and um, and look, I, I if he's asked to do it, then that's fine, you know. I, I do you think he's 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 no? I mean, anyone would do that, and good on him. You know, I have nothing, yeah. I'm nothing against Steve. I've got nothing against anyone now. You know, I mean, maybe you know Bruce Floor probably. <laughs> uh, but you know he's just well, a, you know he, he's uh but that's life you know but so so yeah they, they yeah it was um it was it was difficult uh but but i was you know i don't think once i've ever really spoken to dave between albums you know it's not, he's not you know he has his own very private life with Ashley and the kids and um and I I was you know I become very I become very close with my artists when I'm with them but maybe it's be why my marriages don't work out either it's like you know after I become very close with them then you move on to another one <laughs> you know and that's uh yeah that's that's life isn't it so um yeah but, but then so when have I have you uh yeah. sorry go ahead have i what i was gonna say have you listened to some devil and uh the no, record I, and i i i went for many many years never really listening to records because it was mm. i was always working on them so the idea yeah. of of coming home and listening to records but uh i just this morning, actually, I was listening to the the, the latest Dave Matthews Band album, and oh, okay. I just I, I didn't get very far because then I had to come and come on with you. But um, <laughs> sorry, you know. <laughs> no, it's okay. But it's you know it's okay. I don't. Although, I, but I would never ever even listen to my own albums. Now I do listen to my own albums a little bit because I mm. feel like it's long enough and I'm never, and I, you know, I, I do it for the memories. I do it. I don't do it to critique the record as much as do it like looking at holiday photos, because it mm. reminds me right. of those nice times that we had, you know, um, I don't, I don't listen to it to go, Oh, is that drum out of time? Or is, you know, I should have a little bit more 4k on the snare drum. I don't think like that. I just think of the big, warm picture of 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 bearsville studios and going to get wheatgrass shots and dave saying it tastes like licking a lawnmower you know I always, <laughs> I remember, whenever i have whenever i have wheatgrass now i always think of licking a lawnmower uh, that's amazing <laughs> well yeah steve i think we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours about all of this but until dawn that's gonna until yeah. dawn we could, we could. Until dawn guys but yes. i know um, that, uh, that, that 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 nolan is a little bit under the weather bruce you look look fantastic with your your, your blurry background i love that i love that <laughs> the, the carefully placed acoustic guitar on the sofa just behind yes. your left ear very classy um <laughs> so over to you nolan yes so i think that's going to wrap up part one and <gasps> do I get will... to do a part two? Yes, I do. If we'll you'll come it. back. I would love to. It would be my honor to come back. Amazing. Well, be on the lookout for part two 
coming out soon. Right, if you like that, there's going to be even more revelations in part two. Yes, about we'll jump into fish a little bit. We'll talk about away from the world, deep dive on that. And um, another word about Augusta. Fantastic. Wow. That's that's more a Norlander. Um, We've said his name enough. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we'll do some rapid fire next time too. That'll yeah, be yeah, I'm so quick hitters. Quick. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, that'll be fun. Right. Thank yeah. you guys so much. I, I've enjoyed it, really have. And um, thank you for 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 flying the flag. And uh, always, you better believe Thanks it. So much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. and Cheers. we'll see everyone for part two next time on the corner of Gray Street. I'm even going to tune in for that one, guys. Osiris.